。根据劳工市场展望报告预测，比斯省未来十年将有超过一百万个新的工作职位。比斯省会继续履行承诺，提供专项教育及培训给省民，以应付大部分新的工作的需求。我们会确保省民和比斯省都准备好迎接未来的机会和需要。Good morning, I'm Ravi Kalan, Minister of Jobs, Economic Recovery, and Innovation, and I'd like to start off by acknowledging that I'm speaking to you today from the traditional territory of. The Lekwungen-speaking people, the Songhees and Esquimalt nations, joining me here today are、uh, Minister of Advanced Education and Skills Training, Minister An Kang.、Uh, we've also got Canel Argue,、uh, who is a student from Camosun College, and we've got Steve Munford, who is a CEO of Trulio,、uh, a tech company based out of Vancouver. We're very excited to be here today to speak to you about both the challenges and the opportunities that lie ahead. Today, we get our first look at BC's labor market outlook for the next decade. This outlook is full of incredibly useful information for young people to plan their future, for universities and colleges to develop their courses, and for employers to develop their human resource plans. The labor market outlook is also very important for government as we plan for the future. It's built on the most reliable, relevant, up-to-date information and economic modeling we have to forecast the kinds of jobs that we believe are coming. I must say that as the Minister for Jobs, Economic Recovery, and Innovation, I find this year's forecast particularly interesting as we're putting on the finishing touches of an economic plan. Here's what the report says: BC's labor market outlook is forecasting one million jobs opening over the next decade. One million jobs. We all know that this demand will not be met without meaningful steps to reduce barriers for those that are、uh, disproportionately impacted by the labor market. Just on Friday, our last jobs report showed that once again BC is leading Canada's economic recovery. We have the lowest unemployment. We have the highest job recovery rate in all of Canada. There's 63,000 more people working in British Columbia than there was prior to the pandemic, and that's not all. Just in the first three quarters of 2021, over 70,000 people have moved to British Columbia from other provinces. This marks the largest net migration in 28 years. So no doubt about it, BC is the place to be. But what I found most interesting in this report is the type of jobs that are coming to the market. For every 10 new jobs in the next decade, eight will require post-secondary education or some form of skills training. That tells us a lot about where our economy is heading, and what we need to do to get ready. It tells us that our competitive advantage is our people, and it tells us that when we invest in people. When we nurture the skills and talents of British Columbians, we are building a high-scale, high-care economy that works for everyone. When I talk to business owners and leaders across the economy, I hear the same message over and over again: a skills gap is looming. So let's work together to close it. Let's aim high. Let's make sure that every British Columbian has the skills and the talents needed for the jobs of tomorrow. To talk more about how we will address the increased need for training, I'd like to invite my colleague, Minister Ann Kang, the Minister for Advanced Education and Skills Training, and also after that we'll have Conell Argue, who is a student who's joining us today from class at Camosun College, to say a few words. Minister, over to you. Thank you, Minister Kalan, and good morning, everyone. The launch of the latest labor market outlook is an exciting day. I'm honored to be speaking to all of you from the traditional territories of the Lekwungen-speaking peoples, the Songhe, Esquimalt, and Wissanik nations. I also like to acknowledge how much British Columbians have overcome recently. COVID-19 has challenged us in ways never imagined, and our neighbors. And our loved ones have been affected by fires and flooding all within、uh, the same year. But through these challenges, we've learned a lot about being resilient, adaptable, 
and about working together. Our sense of community is our strength, and it is what allows us to build a stronger BC moving forward. In honor of Black History Month, I'd like to quote from BC's very own Rosemary Brown, Canada's first Black woman elected to provincial legislature. She said, we must open the doors and we must see to it that they remain open so that others can pass through. Looking to the future and opening doors is the purpose of today's announcement. The new labor market outlook offers an exciting picture of our future. Exciting for British Columbians seeking career opportunities. Exciting for businesses in our diverse and innovative economy. The labor market outlook tells us that there are more than 1 million job openings projected over the next 10 years. The future looks so bright. From jobs in the care economy, including social assistance, education, and healthcare, to skills trade and science and technology, the opportunities are plentiful. With this in mind, we need to be prepared. People are the heart of BC's labor market, and our economy will always depend on the people of British Columbia and a growing skilled labor workforce. We want to make sure our people, our province are ready to meet the opportunities and the demands of the future. We want to make sure everyone can benefit from 1 million job openings and a strong labor demand this report forecasts. In the next decade, Nearly 80% of job openings will require some sort of post-secondary education. Our government is committed to providing post-secondary education and skills training that will be required for the vast majority of job openings. If you're entering the workforce or looking for a new career, there are so many opportunities in the horizon. I have spoken to students throughout the province and I know how important this information is for them and for their parents too. I met with students at BCIT during Apprenticeship uh, Recognition Month and toured their welding, carpentry, and steel fabrication classrooms. And I got a sense of pride from all of them about the in-demand careers they were embarking upon. Through apprenticeships, they are meeting people in the industry and many had jobs already lined up for them. A wonderful thing about being an apprentice is that you can earn while you learn. And I know Connell knows about that and he'll be telling us about it later. Last summer, I traveled to Okanagan College in Kelowna and I met a nursing student who felt secure knowing that she was picking a meaningful, well-paying career with strong job prospects anywhere in British Columbia. Students everywhere express a sense of optimism for our province. As this market outlook, uh, labor market outlook shows, there are openings in every part of BC. This information helps students, educational institutions, businesses, and governments prepare for the future. But for students and parents, having this information is just a start. Making a career move is a big decision, and there are a lot of factors to consider. To support students and anyone making career decisions, WorkBC.ca has several tools available right now to help people decide what's right for them. WorkBC.ca can help people find what the career, uh, current wage rate is for certain jobs, what jobs are in demand and where they are in demand, how easy it is to get a job in a particular field now, and how easy it will be in the future. And of course, close to my heart, People can find out exactly what education and skills training they need to start a new career or transition into a new one. Part of my job is to make sure people have access to that education and skills training. And our government is working to break down barriers so that with the right supports and training opportunities, everyone in BC can benefit from these new job openings. I am so proud that we are increasing student spaces in public post-secondary institutions, in tech, in healthcare, in engineering, and more. For instance, we've added 500 new nursing seats, more than 1,000 new early childhood educator seats, and almost 3,000 tech-related seats set to produce thousands of tech grads in the near future. We are also introducing legislation this spring to implement skilled trade certification. 
This will bring more career opportunities and bring more value and prestige into the trades. We're making sure that finances aren't a barrier to education and have expanded programs through millions of dollars in investments that are helping thousands of students. Those investments include expanding the tuition waiver for former youth in care, introducing tuition-free adult upgrading, cutting interest on student loans, creating the BC Graduate Scholarship Program, and expanding open education resources. We have also invested $47.5 million in new funding to help people who are underworked or unemployed upskill or reskill and find new opportunities. Our government is committed to growing BC's economy for everyone and the labor market outlook provides great insight on how we can make that happen. With the right education and skills, each of us will help make BC's workforce a vibrant and sustainable source of growth over the next decade. Diversity will be our strength as we continue to build an innovative and inclusive economy and a stronger BC that benefits everyone. I encourage students, teachers, parents, or anyone seeking information to help them make career decisions to visit work bc.ca and use the tools available. That's a lot of information available to help people to get good jobs and support a stronger BC. I will now turn it to uh, Conal, is it Conal? <laughs> Conal Argue, who is an amazing student at Camosun College to share his experience. Over to you, Conal. Thank you, Minister. About 10 years ago, seeing the Tesla on the road was like seeing the Lamborghini or Ferrari. And now we're seeing them being used as taxis. And who knows, maybe they'll be delivering your pizzas next week. So seeing this increase is really what sparked my interest in electric vehicles. And I was really lucky to have an instructor at Camosun College who shared that interest. And he was allowed, uh, he was able to share his knowledge on electric vehicles, even though that may not have been the focus of the course. And after completing my training, uh, furthermore, there is now a fully electric vehicle course here at Camosun College. So I was lucky enough to partake in the pilot program and, uh, and gain that knowledge on electric vehicles, which I use daily in the field. Um, so that is really exciting because I'm just trying to further my education as much as possible because soon I would like to trans my, transition my career to become a teacher so I can give that knowledge back and share my enthusiasm for electric vehicles with uh, students and, uh, and people who are gonna be working in the field in the years to come. That's great, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Kang, and uh, thank you so much, Connell. I, uh, I think uh, I'm wishing you well in your, uh, in your training, but also uh, it's amazing to hear that soon you'll be training others and that's what we need uh, in our economy. Uh, as I've been meeting with British Columbians uh, from every part of this province, uh, from all walks of life, including business leaders, uh, innovators, First Nations representatives, entrepreneurs, and not-for-profits, Connell's remarks remind me something I've heard time and time again. People are our competitive advantage. People are what bring communities to life, and it's our people that make our economy grow. But what we know that businesses are challenged to recruit and retain talent in all sectors of this province. And with 1 million new jobs on the horizon, we need to do more to address the looming skills gap that lies ahead. So more people can find jobs that they want and BC businesses can continue to shine here at home and on a global scale. Just a couple of weeks ago, I had the opportunity to meet Steve Bunford, CEO of Trulio. I was just absolutely blown away at what Steve has been able to accomplish. There are, they are a massive success story. One of the 14 unicorns BC has seen in British Columbia, valued over a billion dollars. Here to tell you more about Trulio, I'd like to invite Steve Munford to say a few words. Steve, over to you. Thank you, Minister. Um, we certainly are seeing many of the trends that you guys talked about this morning and, and really want to applaud you for the research and the initiatives that you announced. Um, you know, truly, I want to punctuate one point, which you, you talked about, which is this province, you know, 
it's the talents of people that attracts industries and it's the talented of the workforce that creates great companies. You know, we've had a lot of success at Truly over the last couple of years. Um, our demand for our product has spurred unprecedented growth and attracted capital from south of the border. Last year, we raised over $500 million to invest in our company to accelerate our growth. And for a tech company, that means investment in people. Last year, we went from about 120 employees to 320. We added 200 net new jobs. We currently have 120 job openings that we're recruiting for. We also have 30 co-op students that we have in the company from over seven different institutions here in BC. And we're not alone. There's a lot of companies, as you point out, like us. And we're building the, the ecosystem here in BC, and we're building a lot of great tech companies that are competing on a world scale. We're also seeing a lot of international tech companies come here to BC to set up their R&D workforce. And that, those two combined is creating incredible demand for talented, technical-oriented people. And really, we're only going to solve that demand and allow us to grow if we invest in the training spots, the educational spots that you've talked about expanding today. But also, I, I really do like your approach, which is let's educate the youth, the children, about where the jobs of tomorrow are. Let's inspire them to take on some of the, these technology roles and solve some of the world's biggest challenges. And let's do that right here in BC. So just to echo, we got the ingredients to have a phenomenal tech industry here, one of the best tech industries in the world. And it really is the people and its ability to train, develop the people here that's going to continue to allow it to grow in the future. So thank you, Minister. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Steve. And uh, again, a huge congratulations to you and your, uh, your company for all the success. Hiring 170 people last year and 120 more openings is, is quite incredible. And, and I wish you uh, success. When you succeed, we succeed. So thank you, Steve. Really appreciate that. Next week, Premier Horgan will be releasing our economic plan. You will see a further commitment to addressing this moment. A plan that will outline a generational commitment to invest in people through skills training, education, and supporting people with the supports that they need, like childcare and housing, particularly for our young British Columbians. And I want to end today by speaking directly to them. I know that many of you are worried about the future. I know it's been a very, very difficult last two years. You have sacrificed a great deal to keep yourself safe and your community safe. And I want to say thank you. I think we want to say thank you. But I want you to know the better days are ahead. Your ambitions and dreams are our best hope. And we have, and we have your back as we move forward. Today's labor market forecast shows us again how many opportunities are out there. We will help you seize those opportunities so that you can realize your best potential for you, for your community, and for all of us. So thank you for all for being here today. And uh, Minister Kang and I are now um, available to take any questions. Thank you very much. A reminder to reporters on the line, please press star one to enter the queue. You'll be limited to one question and one follow-up. Our first question today comes from Rob Shaw, Czech News. Oh, sorry, uh, Minister, slightly, I guess, off topic, but could you talk to us a bit more about that economic plan that you just mentioned that's coming next week from the Premier and also uh, about the upcoming uh, session of the legislature, the throne speech that's starting uh, tomorrow and the new opposition Liberal leader, Kevin Falcon, if you could just kind of walk us through your thoughts on that. Well, there's a bunch of things there. I'll start off by um, uh, the economic plan. The Premier next week will be unveiling the economic plan. Uh, I'm very excited uh, about the plan. It, uh, of course, we've had Stronger BC plan, which has guided us through the pandemic, uh, you know, historic level supports to ensure that our businesses can continue to operate. But now we need to start looking forward to what's the province going to look like over the next decade? What are the jobs and opportunities? And how do we start transitioning our economy to prepare for the changes that we know are already happening. And so I'm excited to see that come next week. Of course, the throne speech and the budget are key parts of uh, our vision for how we move forward. And uh, I'm excited for that. 
And uh, of course, uh, the BC Liberals have a, a new leader, um, uh, Mr. Falcon. And uh, I'll start off by saying that uh, whether it was Mr. Wilkinson or Ms. Bond, uh, we take all the leaders uh, of the opposition very seriously. Um, I know there's a lot of people that have a lot of things to say about Mr. Falcon. Uh, for example, uh, some have said he's a leader of the past, status quo that actually failed to deliver good government, uh, old style politics and backroom deals. Uh, and those are not my words. Those are the words of his colleagues. Uh, I just happen to agree with them. So uh, we look forward to seeing him in the legislature when he arrives. Uh, and we're going to have a great debate. Rob, do you have a follow up? No, I'm good. Thank you. Our next question, we go to Richard Zussman, Global News. Uh, Minister Callan, uh, we're talking about... Um, job openings and retirements today. Seems like Andrew Wilkinson will be retiring, opening up a job there. Uh, is uh, the expectation this government will call a by-election quickly to allow Kevin Falcon uh, to be in the legislature? And why were you so quick to be critical yourself on Saturday um, of the new Liberal leader? Are you guys worried about him? Well, as I've highlighted, um, the words that I refer to are actually the words of his colleagues. Uh, and so uh, I just happen to agree with those words. Uh, you know, I think it's important to remind British Columbians that he just left a little while ago, uh, and he has a record, a, a history. In fact, he was the architect of some very deep cuts uh, to the province that we're still paying for today. Uh, and so I think it's important to remind British Columbians of his record, uh, of what he did when he was here. And of course, uh, if uh, one of the MLAs were to retire uh, and, uh, and there was an opportunity for him to be in the legislature, I'm sure we would take that opportunity to, to see him come. Uh, we welcome the debate. Uh, you know, I would say that uh, a big thank you to Minister, uh, to uh, Ms. Bond. I think she did a great job as an opposition leader. Uh, and uh, but we'll leave it to the BC Liberals to decide uh, who wants to leave uh, the ship as it is now. Richard, do you have a follow-up? Yeah, also on the theme of job openings over the next decade, uh, there are a lot of BC Liberals planning not to run against John Horgan in 2024, uh, expecting that for various different reasons, uh, including his recent recovery from cancer, that he will not run again. Are you expecting that he will be the leader in the next provincial election? Or are there plans potentially for someone else to be squaring off against Kevin Falcon in the next election? Well, I'm planning for Premier Horgan to be running again. Uh, you know, if you look across the country, he uh, the position that he is in, he's the envy of uh, all premiers across the country, and, and rightfully so. Uh, he has been balanced. He's been measured. He's been thoughtful. Uh, he's uh, come through uh, his challenges with cancer with grace. Uh, always reminding us about other people and worried about other people's health more than than he's worried about his own. And so uh, he is uh, phenomenal. He's got my 100% support. And I have every expectation, so did my colleagues, that he will be leading us into the next election. Uh, and we welcome the challenge from Mr. Falcon or whoever may be their leader in the next election. Next question, we go to Derek Penner of the Vancouver Sun. Hi. Yeah. During the technical briefing, um, mention was made of a, a sort of possible gap in um, uh, the workforce. Um, some 83,000 jobs we might sort of run short of people for. Um, also made mention of the number of people who are um, not in the labor force who could be and possibly want to be. Um, what are the strategies for um, looking at targeting those those people who aren't in the workforce but could be, um, what 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 are the strategies to to get the people who want to be in the workforce in the workforce? I know, Mr. Yeah. yeah, I know Minister Kang has got some comments. I'll just say that this is both a challenge and a great opportunity for British Columbia. I mean, one million new jobs. Uh, you know, the labor market outlook highlights the fact that we're going to have more jobs than perhaps people, uh, which is a challenge, but also a great opportunity. We've already made historic investments, and we're going to need to do a lot more. Uh, I'll let Minister Kang jump in because I know she's got some things to say. Uh, 
Thank you so much for that question. Um, we do know that there is a gap in skilled uh, workforce and our future workforce. And, and we also know that there are approximately 150,000 people who could be working but are not working right now. And the strategies that we're looking at is providing the health and support, um, the programs that they need to come back into workforce. For example, um, they may be young parents who could not find childcare. So our, our, our provincial daycare uh, strategy will be supporting the wraparound services for young parents to come back into the workforce. And another example could be those during the pandemic decided to retire early, not for any other reason, not, not for reasons of age, but they just decided to retire. So we are going to be providing skills and supports. We have short-term programs. We have programs that are going to be reskilling and upskilling. But of course, we do have have the support of our public post-secondary institutions, support from our private uh, institutions and other training institutions and the industry as well. So this, this will be an effort that collectively everyone in the province works together. Uh, the support and services will be there. And we also know that um, other skills will be required to come back for uh, perhaps practical skills and competencies. So our short-term programs will include that. And we're going to make education affordable, available, but as well relevant to everyone. And this is the way we're going to be encouraging people to come back into the workforce. Thank you. Derek, do you have a follow-up? Yeah, um, also related to demographics. Um, so you saw in the, in the technical briefing uh, discussion that uh, future, there will be a point in the future where we are relying solely on immigration for uh, population growth um, and sort of people to fill jobs in the economy. How is, how is this government going to address uh, recognition of uh, foreign credentials and um, accessible sort of bridging from foreign training into um, British Columbia accreditation for some of those skilled jobs where um, we've continually seen people um, feeling excluded from um, overly protective um, uh, qualifications? Thank you so much for this question. And um, we want everyone who comes here to British Columbia uh, reach their full potential. Those who have brought their talents and have chosen British Columbia beautiful British Columbia to be their home. And I am working very hard with my uh, colleague, uh, Minister uh, Osborne, Minister of Municipal Affairs, to find a solution to fast track credential recognition. Uh, immigration may be one of the solutions. Um, fast track credential recognition may be one of the solution. As well, we recognize that there is in-migration from province to province across British Columbia, but as well, encouraging young people to, uh, to, to pursue careers quickly in their life, as well as those who have chosen to retire early, these are also some of the solutions. So uh, there's many great solutions and we are exploring and working on all of them right now. For the next question, we go to Martin McMahon, City News. Thank you for taking my question. I want to ask about healthcare specifically, which is where you expect to see the biggest number of openings. How confident are you that you'll actually be able to fill those spots? Uh, thank you for that question. And healthcare is one of our in-demand jobs uh, with high opportunities and high pay. Um, we know that uh, there, there will be, um, as, as a result of the pandemic, we have seen an exasperated uh, gap in the need for healthcare workers. Um, so five industries that will account for half the job openings and healthcare and social assistance uh, take up 14 0.2% of that. And, and so what we are doing is, as many things, we have targeted funding in our public and pri private post-secondary institutions, sorry, correction, uh, in our public post-secondary institutions, but we also have expansion of uh, the nurse practitioner programs at various universities, um, UBC, UVic, UMBC. We, we focus on uh, rural, remote, but also urban uh, uh, post-secondary institutions as well. Um, we know that increasing number of specialty nursing students will also be very supportive in the healthcare um, in industry. And um, in Fort St. John's, we also see that there will be a new baccalaureate level nursing uh, program there. We're not doing things just for the long term, but there's also things that we are doing right now, such as the fast track. There's a new one-time fast track seats for respiratory therapists. So we will be looking into work learning integrate, uh, sorry, work integrated learning programs so that people can be in the field right away, learning and earning at the same time. We have um, uh, longer programs that take a longer time, but we are creating these seats and we will be uh, making sure that there are targeted funding to support that. 
And together, working cross ministry, working with uh, Minister Dix, will make sure that British Columbians get the support that they need. Martin, do you have a follow-up? Yeah, I mean, do you have concerns about potential major recruitment issues, though? I mean, we've got an entire generation of kids who have seen healthcare workers antagonized and challenged in ways most reasonable people would stay a million miles away from. Yes, uh, so... Um, one of the initiatives that we're working with with the health ministry is the recruitment and retention. Not only do we want to recruit young people um, into this field, um, we also want to make sure that they stay because we know that this is a very stressful um, but also a very rewarding uh, job opportunity. Um, our government has started to invest in healthcare since 2017. And, um, in budget 2021, we have uh, uh, we have invested 96 million to support the expansion of uh, nurse, healthcare assistant, and other priority healthcare uh, professions. But a good a piece of good news here is that our previous invest investment in Stronger BC, 2,000 of those in our uh, work integrated learning uh, healthcare programs, 2,000 of them already graduated or in, um, in, in a position where they're able to be working in the field. And now we are going to be investing in more seats in nursing programs. 500 new nursing seats, um, that's going to be building upon the 2,000 that's currently available. So um, I, I know there is a lot of interest. We will be uh, attracting immigrants, also working with uh, the Minister of Municipal Affairs and with the federal government to make sure that we have a PNP program that is targeted towards the needs uh, the in-demand needs of our industries here in British Columbia. Next question. Oh. I, I believe Minister Callum would like to... A supplemental. Um, I'll just add that uh, I, I appreciate the question around, um, uh, you know, healthcare workers being discouraged by seeing these protests. And I, and I would say to anyone that's uh, young and up and coming uh, or anyone that's looking for a good career, there is huge opportunities in the care economy. And, uh, and uh, that's a fringe group. And overwhelmingly, majority of British Columbians and Canadians, we support our healthcare workers. We support the incredibly important work that they do. And if this is a career you choose, uh, we will be as a province there 100% to support you through that uh, because we know we need to take care of each other more now than ever. Next question goes to Shannon Waters, BC Today. <clears throat> Hi, um, I'm wondering how you see the province's housing shortage and the fact that housing affordability, both in terms of if you're looking to buy a house and if you're a renter in BC, have only gotten worse over the past several years, how you think that that may impact recruiting efforts and efforts to address the labor shortage that is expected over the next decade? Uh, that's a great question, Shannon. And, uh, you know, there was a time when you had a discussion about the economy and you'd be talking about taxes and talking about how to, you know, perhaps uh, give a few million dollars to a a specific sector to help them grow. Now our business leaders understand, while they've been stood the whole time, but I think the public is starting to understand that the economy is much more. The economy is the critical need for childcare. The economy is the critical need for housing and infrastructures so that people can move around in their, in, in their regions. And so housing is gonna be a critically part critically important part, just like childcare, uh, is going to be a critically important part of our economy as we go forward. And, uh, and certainly, uh, as we see a need for more people to come and take on the opportunities that we have, we're going to need to see that investment in housing and, and in childcare and in uh, infrastructure to, to go along with it. The good news is we're seeing historic amount of investments right now in housing, investments that we've never seen. In fact, we saw more housing starts this year, um, uh, rental housing starts start this year than we did 16 years prior to our com coming in. And so we're making significant investments, but there's going to need to be a lot more. And of course, we're going to need Canada to get into the game because it's going to be critically important for the Canadian economy to see those opportunities for British Columbians. Shannon, do you have a follow up? Yeah, I'm also curious, um, you know, sort of related on the wage side, generally speaking, wages in BC tend to be lower or not especially competitive with other provinces. And then given what we see in terms of housing affordability and other costs, that seems like it could be a recruiting challenge if you're looking to pull people from other 
provinces to BC to fill some of those vacancies. So I guess, again, how do you see addressing this issue and getting people to come to BC to fill these job openings? Well, for many years, it was an economic policy of previous governments to keep wages down uh, because they thought that that was how businesses would be successful. But what we're seeing now, what's clear is uh, not only that wages have gone up in the last three years, they've gone up $5 an hour. But what's also clear is when people are doing well, they invest back in the community. And our employers are telling us, and I think Steve might want to jump in, uh, because his company hires good paying, uh, with good paying jobs, uh, and they're willing to pay good paying wages for good top talent. And, uh, and we're hearing that across the board from all employers, that they are willing to pay for the talent. Uh, but we need to, as Mr. Kang has highlighted, not only educate the next generation to take the employment opportunities, but also educate our current workforce and give them reskilling opportunities so they can become more productive and help our companies continue to succeed. But I do want to give Steve a chance to jump in because I know this is top of mind for him as an employer. Yeah, and I, I would say I've been in this industry for 20 years and I've certainly seen that change where, where there's almost like a, you know, a natural resource or BC was such a beautiful place that you, you could get away with paying people less in this province. I think that's changed. I think as people recognize the strength of the technology community here and, and the talent here, people are paying global wages uh, and, 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 you know, industry leading wages right here in BC for those folks. So I think certainly for the, the technology industry, we actually are seeing quite a bit of wage inflation. And that really is as our wages catch up to global standards or specifically North American standards. So I think that gap has shrunk and will continue to shrink. And, and I just want to echo something that I, I heard earlier, which is the investment in the infrastructure and the education and, and the pieces that support business is really what we're, we need to do to grow. So it's the people and it's the infrastructure around that. And, uh, and these are good jobs, high paying jobs that we're creating. I'd also just like to add a few points um, very similar to, to the two um, previous speakers that when we look at high opportunity occupations where we're talking about those jobs with um, uh, stronger demand and higher wages. So we think when we think about the affordability or the availability of housing here, this is exactly what my ministry is doing in terms of skilled trade certification. And we want to make sure that uh, tradespeople are valued and, and that um, uh, uh, we attract more people into this valued career. So with more people into the trades, more people into construction, we will be able to meet the demands of our infrastructure needs, the demands of our, of our housing needs, but as well, upgrading everyone, having a, a lifelong learner, learning culture will also support workers to become more effective and efficient and be able to have higher performance um, in our job workforces. So when they are higher performing, they will also get higher wages. So we will be working on all fronts with businesses, with uh, cross ministry in our post-secondary institutions to make sure that workers have affordability here in British Columbia, but also have good wages. Next question goes to Sophie Chavance, Radio-Canada. Yes, hello, hi. Uh, I just took like the press conference like on the way, and I have a question regarding like the climate crisis because we know, uh, except like the COVID-19 situation, there is also that, that crisis that is ongoing. I just like to have more information regarding maybe the new job opportunities in that field because uh, the site the scientific services will be like kind of the main sector. So, is there any things regarding that? Would you mind repeating that and just a little louder? We're actually having trouble hearing you in the studio here. My apologies. Uh, sorry. So I will try to be like a little bit more louder. So I just have a question regarding like the climate crisis. I'm just like wondering if there is like any um, new job opportunities for the coming years in that field. New job opportunities. Uh, so we have 1 million new job opportunities in the next 10 years. And that starts with this year. Uh, sorry, did I... One million, one million job opportunities, and and these um, high opportunities um, are in healthcare and social assistance with forty two percent. Sorry, fourteen point two percent. That's one hundred and forty two thousand job openings in the next ten years. But as well, we have professional scientific, scientific and techno, uh, technical services. That's fourteen percent job openings with one hundred and forty thousand opportunities. 
retail trades with 103,000 opportunities, construction trades that I just talked about, 75 uh, to 76,000 job openings, and as well accommodation and food services with 65,000 job openings. But I'm also going to defer this to uh, the Minister of Jobs, Economic uh, Recovery and Innovation to provide more comments. Great, thank you so much. And uh, and I think the, the question was around uh, climate as well. And and I would say that um, we are very proud here in British Columbia. We have one of the most ambitious climate change plans in all of North America, and that is good for business. Uh, we are seeing uh, an emerging clean tech sector that is uh, is uh, is the envy of Canada. To be honest, uh, we're seeing huge employment opportunities with that, and we're seeing both from private sector and government that when when private sector and government take climate change seriously, it's actually good for business. It's good for the economy. We're seeing businesses that are taking the environmental and social governance structures very seriously, and they are actually becoming more profitable because of it. And they're also preparing themselves for the future. And so we, we don't see climate change, addressing climate change as a hindrance. We see that as a key part of the economy as we move forward. Sophie, do you have a follow-up? Uh, yes, like maybe just to know a little bit more about like the, um, the nature of the of the coming job opportunities in that field. Like, do we have to expect like any specific job opportunities with the climate change, for example, like more fight fighters or job like this? We're seeing huge opportunities when it comes to clean tech, uh, whether it's companies that are helping us decarbonize our economy. And it's not only creating products, it's also those that are providing services. Uh, we're seeing huge opportunities with um, uh, the transition of fuel, uh, whether it's uh, work that uh, Connell highlighted in his uh, speech around uh, our cars and the changing nature of uh, both uh, automobiles, but also heavy duty vehicles. Uh, we're seeing huge opportunities in our building environment uh, with mass timber in particular and, and how we address embodied carbon and use the new technology and innovation to not only build buildings faster, do them in a climate resilient way, uh, and also um, ensure that the whole sector is, is profitable in doing so. So we it's, it's across the economy. Uh, addressing climate change is not one piece. It's not just transportation. It's across, uh, across the, all of our economy. And even companies like Trilio put a lot of focus on climate change uh, in the work that they do. So it's, it's every business is thinking about it. And certainly from government, uh, we're proud of the work we've done, but we have a lot more to do as we go forward.